Not just a one. One bedroom. We got speed. Just one. One. One bedroom. It's not a pool. In the bedroom? No. <laughs> nah. Nah. Just got an apartment. <laughs> Lifestyle. I mean, like you just mentioned, you have, you have an apartment. Yeah, I finally Are you found have one. Like a mansion someday, or, or what? I, I kind of doubt it. <laughs> uh, two rooms would be enough. One for all my junk, and one to sleep in. Yeah, all I need is uh, a room to put all my toys and comic books and guitars in a bedroom. Go play in. Playroom. <laughs> tell, tell me about your, your comic collection. Collect old comics from 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and then new comics too. They take up too much room on the bus. <laughs> so when Kirk's not there, we go out and sell them. <laughs> ah, ah, that's, ah, that's, that's where what they, they went. went. <laughs> Is that where you like your spare time on tour? I mean, yeah. Well, well, I mean, you know, you roll into uh, a city, like, <laughs> check out local comic stores, you know. Buy toys, you know, that sort of thing. That's what I do in my spare time when I'm uh, I'm at home, when I'm not playing guitar or whatever. We've <laughs> got a couple of um, do a segment called "Addicted to Style," about fashion and things. So. No. <laughs> <laughs> I know you guys are like real high on the GQ list, like I told Lawrence. Yeah. Um, <laughs> describe your style. What? Just hate shopping for clothes. <laughs> Uh, I hate ma I hate trying to match colors, so I just wear black and white. Oh, just comfortable clothes. Yeah, I just like dressing comfortable. Don't really care what not it looks like. Too hip to the new fashion, you know. <laughs> it's a, there's a lot of people who really get really involved in like new trends and fashion. And Spend a lot of money on clothes. Yeah, it's, it's just it's what's the point? I mean, See we dress for ourselves. We don't dress for other people, basically. Yeah. The people, whoa, it's the new fashion, gotta go buy it. Yeah. And something they bought last week is hanging in their closet, you know, forever. Yeah, because it's out of fashion. You guys, like, wear the same clothes on stage and off stage. Why is that? Not the exact same ones. <laughs> but we wash them in between. Just kind of tend to smell bad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they're t comfortable clothes. I mean, we don't feel the need to dress up, you know, to, to we always forget. augment. Yeah, we always, actually, we have all sorts of glittery stage clothes in yeah. a wardrobe case, but we always yeah. forget to wear them. Always write an opening song. Damn, I forgot. Oh, I forgot. I always look over at James and go, James, we forgot again. I got my glittery robe. Darn. Got my boots. Tell me about the t-shirts you wear today. <laughs> Who goes first? James. Uh, this is a homemade one. Some guy in the UK made it for me. Misfits, it's, a, it's off one of their EPs. Just beware EP. This is cool. This is a single that a friend of mine, Glenn Dan. Can you Dan, start again? What's that? Can you start again? Cause I'm oh, the okay. Right. Okay. This is a t-shirt of a single that my friend Glenn Danzig put out. He's a, he's in Misfits. He's now in Sam Hayes. He called knows him. Who Killed Marilyn? It's a pretty cool shirt. Marilyn looking pretty, uh, pretty dead. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just, uh, it's just we like wearing shirts of, of bands, you know, you, you, you like, you know, you're particularly supportive of, you know. Free and, uh, stuff, like, you know. The, right. the, Misfits, the Misfits graphics are really cool, you know, like yeah. the whole horror thing. Got about, really cool. got about 200 shirts at home. I we wear, uh, I wear five, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Let's just sit there. When I pack to go on the road, I just like I just pick out ten shirts and throw it into the, the suitcase. I'm ready. Let's go. <laughs> Come on. Tell us about your manager, like buying the whole band like a million socks to wear. Uh, How'd you uh, know about that? <laughs> the socks I really don't like too. Yeah. <laughs> the kind that don't even go over your ankle. Ah. So Lars likes them though, cause they got little tennis rackets on. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's it's because. W we used to always get all our, our, our socks mixed up with each other, you know? You go into a tour with like 10, <coughs> ten perfect <laughs> perfect sets of, of socks, and you go out of the tour with all mismatched socks and stuff, so... One and like, blue, one uh, green, uh, one yeah. unstretched. And, and like, you know, someone doesn't cut their toenails, and you get socks back, <laughs> it comes back with like holes in <laughs> those are. And when they come back from the washing, they're stapled together now. Yeah. 
Yeah. You put them on. So, I mean, and like people would lose socks and stuff, so we would go on stage with just one sock on and barefoot and shoe. <laughs> so, I mean, after uh, after months and months of, of petty bickering about our socks, we managed to just decide to buy a bunch of socks. Plus, uh, we got some, uh, some, 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 <laughs> we had some something take residence in our wardrobe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we had to like uh, we had to <laughs> we had to oust oust certain articles Living of clothing. organisms. <laughs> oust certain articles of clothing. They were on tour with us. Friends on tour. Meat behind that story, you can tell me, or you'd rather meat well, behind it. Just, <laughs> just in front of it. We just had some, <laughs> just had some tour mascots and decided to take residence in our, our wardrobe case. Tour mascot. <laughs> yeah. Among other places. <laughs> um, Kirk, tell me about your Batman socks. Yeah, oh, yeah, they're the best thing. Yeah. Uh, Jason bought them for me. And like, they're great, they're official Batman Club socks. Ooh. And I wore them on stage in Japan with, along with my fruit salad pants. <laughs> fruit salad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the last gig was real fun. Yeah. I just, the I kid threw up, uh, <laughs> the kid threw up. Uh, <laughs> so some, some pants for me to wear. There were these shorts, like, like tiger stripe felt, you know, like. They're like above his knees and they have a tail. Yeah, they're <laughs> huge too and had a tail. So I put them on. Over his, okay. his, his, his stage pants. And I have these like, these shorts that, that they're, they're, they look like fruit salad and spaghetti. <laughs> that's the pattern that's on the shorts. And he's a vegetarian. Yeah, and like they're above the knee too. And I was wearing my official Batman socks with him. And uh, my styling black socks. And I was looking pretty, pretty stylish. You know? Yeah. The, yeah. Quite the fashion rage. <laughs> yeah, my monkeys T-shirt. We played the encore that way. Yeah, and some guy cool. gave me a little guitar. It's like this big. This of, is in Japan. Like my uh, of my Explorer. It's like the same. It's real small. I played it, <laughs> and it sounded better than my other guitar. <laughs> <laughs> um, one last question, fashion-wise. What you guys love to get for Christmas? Sounds like the movie web game. You don't have to ask this question. Oh, God. Oh, jeez. Ah, jeez, I don't know. Okay, I, right, James, what would you get Kirk for Christmas? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I would get, James? I would, did you ever see that, that, that publicity shot in the Guinness Book of World Records for the world's fattest man? He's wearing a pair of those overalls. That's what I'd get, James, a pair of those overalls. <laughs> yeah, so the whole band can get in at the same time. Yeah. Go out drinking. Yeah. <laughs> so you just have to pay for one person. Yeah. <laughs> on a bus, with yeah. a cab. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Guys. All right. Cool. <laughs> Yeah, it was on, yeah. wasn't it? The one we where I'm sitting seen. babbling on, yeah, the phone on the phone. Yeah, yeah. That was all right, different. It's cool and fucking Bobby, our tour manager, was hella like, <laughs> calls mom, I'm on TV, you know? <laughs> hey mom, I'm on TV, you know? Bobby, our tour manager, it was roaring. It was so funny. Fucking rock star road <laughs> manager, you know, with his sunglasses. And, hey. all right. <laughs> yeah, well, I uh, road manage the band. <laughs> Tell me what you guys have been up to the past couple of weeks. Just got back from Japan a couple of days ago. It was, uh, so that was it. You know, we did 10 days there or something, whatever. Yeah, I mean, before that, as you might know, there was a couple of weeks of auditions and about, what, three days of rehearsal <laughs> with yeah. him and then in at the deep end. <laughs> we did a couple of warm-up gigs down in L.A. opening for uh, uh, Metal Church. Yay, friends. Sitting over here Hi. clapping at us off camera. <laughs> And um, then we did these couple of gigs down there and then flipped to Japan right after that and did five dates over there. Yeah. How'd they go? Roaring. Brilliant. Brilliant. Great. Kids Different. Great, but yeah. Good. It was, really, it was really comfortable, you know, feel. It was really, really cool. The kids were just like mobbing us everywhere, you know. It was great, great fun. <laughs> Nothing but. Lars, <laughs> <laughs> how is it different? Um, well, I mean, there's the obvious difference is like there's no support acts ever. And you go on at like six six thirty, which is a bit strange. Which goes over by eight thirty. It's like you're back at the hotel at eight thirty, going, oh, <laughs> what do we do now? Hey, 
But um, I think one of the main differences is that also most of the audience is women, like girls, yeah, it was, yeah, it was. female. <laughs> And you have like constantly wherever you go, you have like this mob of like little ten-year-old Japanese With cameras, girls man. following you around, taking pictures. And it's like everyone's so polite and they give yeah, you like gifts, and it's timid, like you know, we're courteous. It's cool, yeah. but the whole place is very, you know, there's no like open spaces anywhere. It's got a bit sort of claustrophobic at the end, but they, I mean, it was a lot of fun. Really yeah, was. they all had to stand, you know, like right in front of their seats and stuff, and just you know. Banging while they're standing up. The kids there hip to Metallica's music. Hey. <laughs> There's nothing ever like that has been there. You know, I mean, Maiden, Priest, and that has been there, but no new, you know, intense raging metal band, and so it got accepted really well. You know, really a good thing. <laughs> Tell me about your uh, upcoming North America. Hey, uh, we're going out for how long? Uh, four five, weeks. <laughs> no, we're just going out. And basically, what we're doing is we're doing all the Aussie. <laughs> All the shows that we were supposed to do with Aussie that got canceled mm -hmm. due to either Aussie's, you know, throat or whatever things he was doing. Some some dates got canceled because he had to shoot that stuff for that film and whatever. And um, what basically we're doing is going out and doing all the markets that we missed with him, all the cities, which is like all of Canada and some stuff right here on the East Coast, and then some stuff in the North West area, Seattle. Yeah. More classic yeah, from our friends. <laughs> That'll be and, um, Which is just basically doing all the shows that, and all the cities that we haven't done with Ozzy. And then we go to Europe after that yeah. and do all the dates that we missed after the accident in Europe. Do you guys feel nervous at all? Like Jason, you know? Yeah, I, you know, I, I remember, you know, coming home and. Um, no, I think we got over that. Basically, I think it was really good that we did those uh, warm up dates in LA because. What we wanted to do was sort of ease him in instead of like jumping in at the D band kind of in Japan. So, like, the first gig would be in front of 4,000 kids in Tokyo. And, and for me, I was very nervous the first gig at the country club, and then that was it. And now, just, you know. Each show has gotten way. better as we went, you know. I mean, it was cool that we got to do Japan first because of just how comfortable it was, you know, for me especially, because I I feel a lot of pressure because of, you know, the kids are expecting so much, and, you know. To fill Cliff's shoes, you know, it's a really big thing, and so it's kind of a weird thing for me, but it's getting better each time. These guys have made it ultra comfortable for me, more than I ever expected, really. Tell me about your support group, Metal Church. Who? <laughs> uh, oh, <laughs> come on, throw it. Um, just hella good friends of ours from like way back, yeah. and um, you know, it's like just always great to be touring with bands that we get on with. We've toured a lot with a band in the past called Armored Saint, which are really, really good friends of ours too. And it's like, we out for a long time, it's just good to have, you know, people around that you get on with. We've also done some tours with people that we didn't get on with so much. <laughs> and it's just good to like, you know, have people out with you that you really yeah, get on with like on a thing. personal basis, you know. Yeah. And they're also opening for us on the, all the European dates. So we'll be with them for like the next eight years. <laughs> fun, yeah, fun, fun for all. <laughs> one, one big party. They're pretty much a no-nonsense band, just like you guys are. It must be like a nice compliment. Yeah, I think they're... Yesterday, I was talking to someone in an interview, and he asked me like what bands I thought had the sort of same vibe as us in terms of the way we come across and the way we present ourselves and just sort of like general things. And, and the first band I, I mentioned was Metal Church. I mean, they're just like us. Drunken idiots, <laughs> trying to <laughs> stay on time. <laughs> How's this tour going to compare to the tour you guys just got off of with Ozzy? Um, well, obviously it's different. I mean, the main difference is obviously that we're headlining and we play, you know, an hour and 40 usually when we headline. And on the Aussie tour, the whole day-to-day -day vibe is it's a bit different when you sort of only play 50 minutes a night and when you go on at 7.30, just the way you're day is sort of scheduled in or whatever. It's like just different when you headline. But um, I mean, both both of them are obviously a lot of fun. It's a bit more of a sort of challenge. You have to sort of watch, you know, not to drink too much. <laughs> sure. <laughs> when you headline, get a lot of sleep because I mean, when we play an hour and 40, we can really tell the difference in sort of just how we feel, you know, day to day mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And the energy level is still going to be the same. So yeah, the pace, you know. One of the cool things also is that we're playing some smaller places, obviously, with Aussie, so it's good to 
field, you know, that... Yeah, the energy the exchange close, will be really strong. The kids, instead of like, hey, we know there's 40,000 of you out there, but we can't see any of you. <laughs> so we might as well just play to ourselves. <laughs> I mean, it's just, I mean, we feed a lot off the energy and, and the feedback that we get from the kids. It's like we throw it out at them, they throw it back at us, and it's sort of, it's like a circle that just sort of goes. And it's just good when we like, you know, just play smaller places, you know, 4,000 seaters or whatever. Yeah, no, that intimacy is important for a band like Metallica. How do Definitely. you get used to, though, like, not being able to see past the 10th row? How do you get yourself geared up for a gig like that? I noticed you're playing, like, the Maple Leaf <laughs> Gardens, which is, what, like, 15,000 seaters? 12, 15, or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, you just try and, and communicate as much with the people that you can communicate with. <laughs> you know, it's like you, like I said, you throw a lot of it out there and you. But it's really, and obviously for the guys out front, I'm a bit further back, but I mean the guys out front, you know, when they're long barricades and stuff like that, and it sometimes can get difficult, you know, but I mean, you know they're out there, and I mean, we just try and, and, and really play as aggressively as we can, no, and it just sort of comes out somehow. <laughs> keep the closeness as much as possible, you know. What have you guys learned playing in front of that many people? <laughs> that more people can hear your mistakes. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I mean, I think there comes a point where you get um, quite confident with what you do, and um, which is really good because it's like, the more confident you are with when you play, it's like, I think that shows up in the music and the, and the gig itself when you're a bit more relaxed instead yeah, of, strength, of, yeah. of your all uptight and stuff like that. And I think when you reach a point of, of you know you're gonna go out there and do really well and, and sort of just good confidence, you know, is, it relaxes you in a different way and I think you come across as being a lot more sort of relaxed and sort of on the level instead of being, you know, all tense and, and, and worried about what you're doing all the time, you know. Describe your relationship with your fans. On the level, <laughs> same level. <laughs> no, it's like, I mean, we're just sort of up on the stage playing, but I think that, I mean, we have a very, very close relationship right. with people that Instead of trying I hate the word fans but I mean people that buy our records and you know come to the gigs and whatever I think they really sort of appreciate the way that we come across and there's not any huge pretentious right, which differences is not we're to present not ourselves as like larger than life or whatever you know like yeah, it's not this which works fine for some bands you know they come across in, in sort of larger than life sort of like characters or comic book heroes or whatever which mm. is fine but for us we just seem to do really well on, on being very, very on the level yeah. with these people. And they know that we're not hard to find, hard to get in touch with. They want to come up and say hello. And I think a lot of times when you present yourself as like a, a larger than life sort of character of rock star or whatever, it's like, I think a lot of kids are sort of afraid to come up and hang out or whatever. And, yeah, and, and lose that special touch. And, and the people, you know, just come up and hang out and cool. Just have a very easy going relationship with them. It's not huge differences, you know, we just, on kids <laughs> playing. <laughs> so you're going to be the same, you know, if the next album goes triple platinum, like Electra probably hopes it will, the same old guys. <laughs> Why limit yourself to triple platinum? No, <laughs> we'll see what happens. I mean, you know, obviously there comes a point where it becomes more and more difficult. That's one thing that really irritated me about the Aussie tour was that we're not used to that much security and like, you know, we do like small, you know, 2,000 seaters or even, you know, when we used to play clubs, you just go out and mingle with the crowd and hang out or whatever and like all of a sudden you're playing arenas it's like you know there's like eight security guards between you know the bus and the entrance to the arena <laughs> you know it's like the distance is this long you know it's like I just don't like all this security and all this I hate feeling isolated you know and but obviously there comes a point where it becomes like physically impossible to talk to you know 5,000 people at once you know but we're gonna do what we can <laughs> um. Before I came by, I looked at the last interview I did with you, and you talked about maintaining the same basic principles from when you started. What are those principles? Um, well, I mean, it's not something that's you know written down on paper and like we look at it every day. But I mean, just the general vibe within the band is that we're in a situation. Luckily, with both management and record company, that we're very, very independent in terms of when it comes to writing and doing our thing with songs and recording and the way we go about presenting ourselves and so forth and I mean some of those quote-unquote principles are that we just really like that independence that we have from the sort of business 
associates <laughs> and it's just sort of great and very satisfying to be able to do what we want and do have it the way we want to do it and um, just go about sort of making a lot of these things the way that we feel that we should do them and I think some of the other things are that we really want to stay where we are in terms of who we are as people and, and like I said it's you know really irritating with all the security and, and you try and you just want to stay who you've always been you know and and you know, those are just some of the things that we try and do. <laughs> you mentioned freedom and independence. How important is that to you guys? Um, from a business point of view, very. I mean, I don't think, I think we've shown now that, that we can, I think the Master Puppets album was from some of the business people's point of view, was like, okay, we'll give them a chance at, at, at doing you know, what they really want to do and we'll see if it works. Now we've shown Improving. these people that, that we can do it. The album's you know, gone gold and still doing very well and so forth. And I think that, um, I mean, the freedom now is like we have these people's trust and, and they don't interfere like, you know, with songwriting and, and the way we want to record and who we want to record with and so forth. This guy over here is laughing. But <laughs> these are the people that I'm talking about are standing over here. <laughs> They're gonna buy me dinner tonight. <laughs> what were your thoughts about the future of Metallica when Cliff passed away? Um, mine were that I don't think there was any doubt that we had to carry on and we're gonna carry on. Um, the immediate thoughts obviously were how long it would take to get the whole thing rolling again. And look back on it now, it's really good that the period of time has been so short um, because like the main things that we decided when we met up again you know about a week after the accident was that we wanted to do it as fast as possible which would uh, sort of shorten the time of us sitting around you know feeling sorry for ourselves and moaning and groaning and so forth and we just wanted to get, get back on the road and get back to doing you know what we do which is you know play live and tour and whatever and um, and that's what he would have wanted. Definitely, I mean, he would he would be the first person to encourage it anyway. And I think now, I mean, Metallica has always been about sort of fighting on and fighting against a lot of the things that have always been in our way. We've had some bad, you know, accidents before. With James has broken this, and I've broken that, and blah 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 blah. And broken it's like, which? hey, <laughs> the old heel. <laughs> and um, it's like we've just always been about fighting on and, and sort of carrying on and and going against all the sort of uh, obstacles that come in our way. And obviously, we never encountered anything like this before, but it's like, we have to keep going. I think the whole thing has really given us even more incentive and even more of a kick to sort of really do it now, because now obviously we have to do it for Cliff too. Yeah. And it's like, now there's absolutely no stopping us whatsoever. <laughs> Will the band change at all with Cliff's absence? Obviously. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be different because but, he was... I mean, you know, part of the reason that I think Metallica did so well was that, or was doing so well, is that um, four very strong individual characters, you know, and Cliff was, as you know, very, very unique, both as a personality and as a bass player and very original and different. And um, the first thing we realized was that we were never, ever going to find anyone like Cliff, so it was not like we were sort of looking for a Cliff Burton the second or whatever. And we just needed, you know, a bass player that would would fit in. Jason has, you know, strong individual personality and so forth. And you know, we'll see what happens when we start writing. We don't write on the road, so it's a little early to tell. So, Jason, how'd you find these guys? <laughs> well, I they, leave. They, <laughs> they, uh, they they found me pretty much, you know. I mean, when I um, I heard that they were doing auditions, right? Like whatever, three weeks after the accident or whatever. Um, called my friend Michael and. Uh, you know, we got together or whatever. I told him I wanted to do an audition. And so Lars called me and just went from there. You know, he told me I had four days before an audition or whatever. And so I uh, locked myself in my room with the tapes and just did it. Learned you know, everything I could and and, uh, and and went and kicked the ears. Hey. No, that was it. You know, I just, I, when, I, when I heard that I had the chance, you know, there was no way that I wasn't going to get it. I mean, there's just, I mean, I told myself convince myself there's no way that I was going to let this pass me by because it's like you know a dream come true really so that's what, what it comes bring, down to. What do you bring to the band musically or philosophically? Um, 
I'm just going to try to create, you know, the separate personality. I mean, everybody, like he was saying, everybody's got their own thing. You know, Kirk has his personality, Lars has his, James. And then as as a unit, you know, they all put one quarter in to make the ultimate unit, right? So I'm just going to fill my 25% over here on this side and create my own personality. And, and you know, as far as the bass playing, you know, I'm just going to do my own style. Um, like Lars told me, and he was saying, you know, they're not looking for a Cliff Burton clone, that'd be impossible. There's no way it ever could happen. So I'm just going to you know, play my own style and, and just do, you know, do my thing. And then it seems to be working just fine. I mean, the writing, I think the writing is going to be cool. Where were we? Your background. Okay, um, I came from uh, a band called Flotsam and Jetsam out of Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, we just put out the first album back in the summer. Um, I formed a band with uh, a drummer, Kelly Smith, who uh, you know, we, did, we started about four and a half years ago. And just you know went through many people, many guitar players, and that until the right thing came together, and then did the Doomsday album. And uh, it's, been, it's been getting really good reviews and everything, so... That's that's pretty much it. They, I mean, the style was a lot, you know, been compared to Metallica, and you know they had definitely a heavy influence on the whole thing. It was like Iron Maiden, Metallica type thing. What's your reaction when you found out you were the new bass player? Uh, we were in this this little restaurant, right? It was like um, on my callback day from you know it's like the second audition or whatever second part of it. Um, went into this little uh, food joint and Tommy's we joint. Tommy's joint. Let's yeah. go and. And we were, uh, so we can eat was, there for free. It was like it was like <laughs> my final test was to go out, you know, drinking with the boys. And Lars asked me if I wanted a job, you know. And I stood up on the table and screamed, you know. And uh, what he didn't realize was we hadn't brought any money along <laughs> to pay for the bills. <laughs> no, and James so goes about washing the dishes. <laughs> and he goes, "You want a job?" And I go, ah, you know, scream. And James goes, "Good, you're gonna do be the base runner." Do that again. No. <laughs> do that again. That sound again. No. Okay, so anyway, that was it. You know, they asked me, and I just, you know, I freaked, and it was like a dream come true. I looked up at these guys for a long time, and so it was really kind of <laughs> unbelievable. You know, it's like going, what, what? I'm noticing watching you two guys, there's like a sense of abuse from Lars. A sense of abuse from you? everyone. <laughs> everyone. Do they treat you like that? Like, you're like the new guy hey, the this is you just, everybody. I mean, it's not just the band <laughs> guys on. either. You know? I mean, the, he can't expect to walk into this situation and not get a little flack once in a while. It's like the crew, production people, everybody, and just winding me up. But I'm ex <laughs> I've expected it and learned to kind of deal with it. You know, so it's it's, cold it's not really that big deal. The, the big deal is like when I when I give them a hard time back, they can't deal with it. That's that's the. Uh, hey. That's the one. <laughs> Ford. No, seriously though, you know, I, like I, I'm supposed to be able to take it, and then when I give it back to them, they're like, hmm, hmm, you know. But it's, I'm, ex I'm expecting it. it's getting better. At first, it was, it was really harsh, but now it's all right. Lars, how important is having fun? That's what that's it's it. all about. That's it. <laughs> Feeling, you know, and fun. That's what it's all about. What's the start from Metallica in '87? Um. Well, first we make up all the European dates, like I told you before, mm -hmm. and um, all the remaining dates that were canceled, and um, then it's just back to writing and recording the next record. Um, it's a little early to really say much more than that. I mean, we're just going to start writing and yeah. getting the ideas together and so forth. Um, we've been talking all year about trying to shorten <laughs> that whole period, <laughs> but you know we'll have to see what happens because last time it really. It took a year to write and record Master, and um, there was a lot of time, not wasted, but I mean, there were places where we maybe could have moved it along a bit faster. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. It's easy to sit and say this now. Do you feel any pressure to match the success of that album? Uh, mm, not right now, no. I think it's uh, just going to be a sort of... Because on each album we sort of just progress in, in whatever way that we feel like and like I told you before, there's no pressure from any sort of business people or anything to do something specific. So I mean, because of that freedom we can just sort of go in whatever direction we want. And um, it should be interesting to see what happens in the next. How do you guys measure success or do you care? Any suggestions <laughs> from around the room? No. <laughs> um, it's just cool that um, 
I mean, it's not something we think too much about, obviously, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. But, I mean, when people ask, it's like, it's cool that we've been able to do it our way and not really right. sort of, uh, we haven't really had to change or alter what we do to suit anyone. There's not been any changes made in, in anything that we do to sort of cater to anyone else's needs. And that's very satisfying that we've been able to, you know, go gold in America, Canada, and so forth, and sort of really know that we've done it our way. That's not been any compromises to do anything, you know, to sell more records yeah, or to right. whatever. To please I mean, that's somebody very else satisfying. or what. Yeah. And I mean, that is success to me, which, you know, that's cool. I think the, I think the new stuff is going to be way good. I mean, they're, they're going to be up to standard from any, even just a little bit of stuff that I've heard, you know, that, that like James and Kirk are coming up with. Uh, it's going to be easily up to standard, there's no doubt. That weird television. Tell me about the new video. Oh yeah. <laughs> what, what do you mean you didn't get it yet? This is it. This what? Is it. what you didn't get? You're not playing it. What the tape didn't get there? Maybe yeah, it got lost on? in the mail or something. Hey. No videos. <laughs> no, there's not been a huge need for one at the moment, or at least up until now. And we keep saying, well, next album we'll do one, so um, let's see what happens. <laughs> what about doing something like a live thing for your fans? I'm sure there's a demand for it. Yeah, we yeah. actually talked about that too at one point. <laughs> but it, I don't know, it never sort of, we always talk about this in the back lounge at the tour bus with our manager, but never seems to get any further than that. <laughs> um, that would be the cool thing, a live one, any, any kind of studio type thing would be, you know. Well, in the article in Spin Magazine, interesting oh, no. bit about uh, your open-minded parents. Tell me about that. <laughs> oh, um, my open-minded parents are just a little different than other parents, cool. I would say. Cool. Um, my dad's fairly different dad. <laughs> He's um, still to this day got longer hair than I have. Long well, hell beard. Long He's beard. a really down cool his, guy, though. Way cool. Down to his uh, navel. Um, <laughs> And um, he was, you know, a tennis player, you know, all up through, you know, 50s and 60s, professional and traveling all over the world. So I had to, like, travel a lot in the early days when I was growing up. And he was in the same sense that I think that Metallica is very sort of different from the rest of the sort of normal heavy metal stuff or whatever. He was, like, the very different tennis player on the predominantly very white and conservative tennis circuit, you know, back in the 60s and the 70s and was sort of the different one and sort of the hippie guy with the long hair and with the different attitudes and so forth and, and it was just different kind of upbringing, <laughs> different parents. My mom still can out drink me any day of the week <laughs> and even James too <laughs> and, um, you know, cool, cool parents. What was your reaction when you go home and kill them all and said, look, my look, dad? Hey. <laughs> no, I mean... A lot of that stuff in the early days, you know, with the demo tapes and, I mean, me and James used to do a lot of that ourselves and we used to, used to do it over at my house and so it's not like, it was not like I brought home Kill Em All and here, hey, look what I've been doing the last two years. <laughs> I mean, they knew what was going on. They just, I mean, encourage what I do and sort of really support me with what I want to do. There was never any pressure for me to sort of fall in my dad's footsteps and be a tennis player or anything like that, even though it would seem very like the obvious thing for me to do because I was brought up, you know, in 10 years traveled on the tennis circuit, you know, and whatever. But I mean, they're just sort of um, encouraging me to do what I want and he be happy with. told you to practice to the hilt and everything. Jason, how about your parents? The hilt? You know, what does that mean? Fullest, you know, like, <laughs> the, the hilt? <laughs> My parents are... Your words are every day. At, you know, at first when, when I... When I first took off from Michigan to, you know, be a rock bassist or whatever, right, they were, it was totally against their wishes. Um, and, you know, the Flotsam's thing started happening and they were real happy about that, you know, and started, you know, backing me. And, and now that this uh, Metallica thing has happened, they're just you know, ecstatic, just, you know, really, really proud, really happy. Just one more thing. Um, we're doing a segment called Addicted to Style, which has to do with, a lot with fashion and things. I know your band is like real high in the G. Okay. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm just going to ask you a couple hey. questions on that. Um, visually, describe your style. Visually, um, comfortable. 
That's it. That's it, man. Comfortable. Comfortable. As far as I'm concerned, I mean, which has like been one of the basic ingredients in this band the whole time, is that if you can't do something different and original, then don't even do it at all. And I mean, it became very obvious very early that there was not really ever going to be any huge, flashy image or anything like that. And I mean, to follow and just do what every other band has done would be right. stupid anyway. And just. I mean, for us, the main thing is just to be comfortable. Be and ourselves, really, you know. Yeah. Don't put on any kind of front or makeup yeah. or whatever stupid. What you thing, see is what gimmick. it's all about. It's real. <laughs> this is like what we actually yeah. wear, even outside of this interview. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's just us what, doing, you know, what we do, being comfortable and and being ourselves. And there's not a huge false front put up, you know, or you know, like um, things hanging out here on the underlids of our eyes or anything like that, or. No, I mean, it's just us doing what we do, and other bands do other things that they do, which is cool. And, and well, we this just, is just what we feel. I mean, if they really feel that, then that's fine, but we're just doing do it because it's... There are other things to spend money on than clothes. <laughs> Describe to me what you're wearing. I have on a pair of Nike running shoes with a... It says Nike Air on Mine it. Mine too, Nike yeah. Air. Air, you know, yeah, so... Air. I don't know where the air is hanging out, but they're very, very comfortable. And then I have a pair of white socks on. <laughs> Me too, white socks. I have, um, here, this is the, uh, the demonstration here. Um, all right, here are the Nike shoes here, all right? Style. plug for Nike. Yeah. All right, shock horror. These are also, guess, Nike socks. Ladies and gentlemen, Nike socks. This should earn me some free things from Nike, shouldn't it? Um, we have a pair of jeans on here that are, as you can see, have not been washed for at least three yeah, weeks at now. least a little while. <laughs> And uh, a T-shirt of uh, a young, what, where are they from? Phoenix? Arizona, Phoenix, Arizona. See, one of the Pedophile. cool things about being in a band like Metallica is you get all these free T-shirts of like bands all the time. And I think this band is very fitting to Metallica. It says here, in case you can't read it, it says, hey, little girl, want a piece of candy? Can, and, then, and then on the you back. Can transcribe that any way you want. <laughs> and on the back. And then on the back, says, sure, I'll have a piece of candy. And the old man's getting belted in the head. There you, <laughs> there you have it. Metallica style. And then we have this mic cord here, which is not part of, of my wear today, but it looks pretty hip though, I think. And um, got this necklace that's been hanging here for four years, which brings me extremely good luck. And I have all my rings on, as you can see. And you know, we're just style. hip. <laughs> Last question. GQ. GQ. What fashion item do you want for Christmas? I'll have some new tennies, black ones. Uh, I'll take some clean underwear. <laughs> Can you say that in a, in a full sentence for Christmas? For Christmas, I want fresh underwear. <laughs> Thank you, guys. See ya! You know, that's the first roll-in they're going to pull from this interview.